acceptance, the body of your son, which was sacrificed for our sins. Please help us to take it in a manner you would have us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Supper now being concluded, we have the opportunity to give as we've been prospering. Let us pray. Our Lord and most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to thee with thanksgiving in our hearts, Father. Mindful of so many things uh, that you have so generously blessed us with, Father. Uh, we're thankful for this past week where we've had the opportunity to go out into the world and to earn a living to support not only our family, Father, but uh, the church, Father. We pray that each of us have purpose in our heart and the first fruits, Father. As we give this offering this morning, it will be done uh, in a manner pleasing in our sight and, of course, with our will. In Christ's name, amen.
like to mark your song of invitation, it will be 23, 2, 3. After marking that song, we'll sing 274, 274. <clears throat> chapter 10, where our lesson will be taken from this morning. Certainly good to see each and every one with us this morning, especially if you're visiting. We want you to know you're an honored guest and ask that you would fill out a visitor's card, as Bill has already uh, said something about a few minutes ago. So that would be good if you would do that for us. And uh, we are glad that you have come our, our way. We look forward to couple of weeks from today, we will begin our uh, campaign and gospel meeting. Young men from Memphis School of Preaching will be doing the preaching in this campaign and gospel meeting, and they also will be knocking doors uh, Monday through Thursday, and uh, we look forward to the time that we will spend with them here with us uh, in the coming week or two. The book of First Corinthians chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would have that ye, sh ye should that I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that our, all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all did eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them and that Christ, uh, that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. 
This morning we're going to talk about faithfulness. Now, we can, we could take the Bible and we could look uh, at different scriptures there as pertaining to uh, this idea of faithfulness. Most assuredly, there are a number of people in the Bible that the Bible refers to as being faithful. You know, Abraham was considered to be the father of the faithful, per se. And uh, there are others as well. In the uh, book of Matthew, chapter 24, Matthew 24 deals with the uh, destruction of Jerusalem, per se. But in verse 45, we have this written. Who then is faithful and a wise servant? whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? Turn over a page in your Bible to the 25th chapter. In verse 21, parable of the talents. And of course we know that the Lord gave unto three of his servants different uh, talents. And uh, one was given five, one was given two, and one was given one. And in verse 21, the one that was given five, when his Lord returned and he had made five other talents, his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful in a few things, I'll make thee ruler over many things. <laughs> verse 23, the, the man that had the two talents had gained two other talents. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. But then when you get down to the one who had the one talent, we see that the Lord answered in verse 26, Thou wicked and slothful servant. He went and hid his talent, the one thing that God gave and, uh, this uh, Lord gave unto him. Thou knewest that I reap where I have sowed not, and gather where I, I have not strong. And so here we see the word faithfulness being used uh, there to those who had uh, done what they should as far as God was concerned. Now, the word faithful, if you look it up in uh, Vine's uh, dictionary, says faithful is full of faith, trustworthy, truthful, honest, loyal. And so when we talk about being uh, faithful, and as Christians we are to be faithful to God, God is the supreme ruler of the universe and, uh, of course, we need to see the importance of being faithful to Him. Israel was God's chosen nation at one time. Israel, of course, is not God's chosen nation today, even though in the religious world many people feel that that is true, that if we do not protect Israel as the United States, then uh, we uh, have failed. Uh, Israel is not go uh, God's chosen people today. Christians are. Just as Israel was back in the Old Testament, Christians are today. We are God's chosen people there. And so we must be faithful to God. God is faithful to us. When was the last time God ever let you down? When did He not do His part? I mean, when God tells us what to do as far as obedience to the gospel is concerned and we are obedient to what He tells us to do, then we can rest assured that... God is faithful. He is going to do His part. He is going to forgive us of our sins. We don't have to worry about that. And there we can be assured that God is faithful to us. Many obey the gospel, but there are few that remain faithful. It's, it's, it's sad, but true. And I guess probably all of us here this morning know of people who at one time members of the Lord's church, and for whatever reason, they fell away. The parable of the sower, when he went to sow the seed, we know the seed had to fall upon good and honest hearts. The ground is referred to there, and the parable refers to the hearts of men. Some hearts are receptive, some are not. Uh, some receive the word of God for a while, and then after a while, the, the, the cares of the world, the riches of the world and guff them once again and they, they go back into the world. And of course, as I said, we know of many who were one time faithful Christians who are no longer faithful to the Lord's church. Uh, all of us could probably count and fill our hands and toes full of those who have done that. And why is that? Why is it the fact that we cannot remain faithful unto God for whatever reason? 
Well, we want to look at this example that we've been given because this is exactly what it is because Paul even says this is an example for us to follow after. Now, God hasn't changed from day one. The God of heaven that uh, was there with Adam and Eve when he created them and put them in the garden, the God of heaven that was with David, the God of heaven that was with Abraham, the God of heaven that was with everyone throughout the ages, has not changed one bit. His thinking hasn't changed. I realize in the religious world today, people are saying that we've got to change with the times. No, you don't have to change with the times. The Bible hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. So there's no reason for us to change when it comes to religion. What God spoke and what the Holy Spirit has given unto us uh, there in the Bible is that which is relevant even today to us. Now... The reason people want to change is they don't want to do what God says many times. They're not content to do what God would have them to do. Now, the children of Israel were a perfect example as far as this idea of faithfulness and unfaithfulness is concerned uh, there. Because the fact is Israel was faithful to God for a while. They were unfaithful for a while. They would go back to being faithful. They would go back to being unfaithful. They would go back to being faithful. They would go back to being unfaithful. Wishy-washy back and forth in the history of Israel. All you have to do is study the Bible in the Old Testament. And you see that time and time again. In the time of the judges, God sent 15 judges to help the Israelites get away from their unfaithfulness to become faithful for a period of time. And then they go right back to it. God did it with the kings. He tried to send kings. The people wanted kings because they wanted to have a king like all the people around about them. And so God sent them kings. And Israel was faithful for a while under some of the kings, unfaithful for a period of time under other kings. And so it seemed to never be to where Israel would always remain faithful. Now the question is, and the thing is evident, that even today we have the same problem. We have a problem of being faithful God. We have a problem of being trustworthy toward God. Now God's not the problem. Let's get that straight before we ever start our lesson. God's not the problem this pro in this equation today. The problem lies with us as individuals because we choose to do things that are contrary to God's will. Many obey the gospel. In the book of Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22, it says, Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. It's a long way to the end of time. You know, uh, we live, only live here upon the face of the earth. Uh, some of us live a long time. Some of us don't live quite as long as others. The Bible talks about four score uh, years. And uh, that being a long time. Four score being 80 years that we could live here upon the earth. And a lot of us live past that. A lot of us live a lot less than that. But the fact of the matter is, we need to be faithful ever how long it is, whether it's 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 60 years. We must be faithful to God. In the end, the ultimate thing, that, the only thing that really matters in the end, am I faithful to God? Am I faithful to God? If I'm not faithful to God, then I lose my soul. Revelation 2.10 says, Be thou faithful unto death and I will give unto thee the crown of life. It's only promised to the faithful. It's not promised to the half-hearted. It's not promised to those who, well, kind of want to be straddled the fence. They want to be a part of God, but at the same time, they want to be of the world. Faithfulness is when we are truly faithful unto the God of heaven. Now, this morning, we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the privileges of Israel. Israel had a lot of privileges, verses 1 through 4. The fact is, Israel was blessed by the God of heaven. Everywhere Israel went, God blessed them. Even in the land of Egypt, you know, the, the circumstances that brought Israel down to Egypt were all set up by the God of heaven. Uh, the land was going to have a great famine, not only just the land of Egypt and uh, that of Israel, the nation of Israel and the countries round about, but the whole world was under famine at the time. And uh, God had put Joseph in a position to where that he would take care of his family, that is Israel. 
Jacob became known. He changed his name from, God changed his name from Jacob to Israel uh, there. And the fact of the matter is that God blessed them in that he delivered them to the land of Goshen. Now the land of Goshen, if you know anything about the land of Egypt, is the most blessed land in all of Egypt. It's kind of like the Delta is as far as farmers are concerned. The Delta, years ago, was productive of a number of crops. It would grow crops good. Why? Because of the sediment and so forth there as far as the river was concerned. And there, as far as Egypt was concerned, the land of Goshen was the promised land, basically. And so Israel was given Goshen. Now, how did that just, that just happen? No, God, providence played a hand in that. And so they were given that. Now, the Bible tells us there came a time when the king Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, knew not Joseph nor the things that Joseph had done for Egypt. And so he began to be concerned about the Israelites because they were multiplying. Everywhere they turned around, there was Israelites popping up. And so he decided he needed to put them under bondage. As a matter of fact, he tried to, to stop the, the building and the delivering of the Israelites by having the male children killed. And that's when Moses came along. You recall the account. His mother put him in the bulrushes in a basket there in the river. And, of course, Pharaoh's daughter found him a little later on. But be that as it may, the, the, the Pharaoh tried to seduce, tried to keep down the growth of the Israelites because he was afraid that they would one day take over the land of Egypt. Well, he put them in uh, bondage. 430 years they were in bondage, and the Bible says God heard their cries. He sent a deliverer. His name was Moses there. <clears throat> and Moses delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of Pharaoh. If you recall the account in the book of Exodus, there were ten... Uh, uh, things that God did to try to get the children of Israel delivered from Egypt. And uh, every time God would bring a plague, then uh, Pharaoh would harden his heart and so forth. But then finally the final plague came, which involved Pharaoh's youngest son. And all the firstborn, <coughs> not the youngest son, but his firstborn, all the firstborn of all the families that did not put the blood of the lamb above the door and above the lintel uh, on the post there, then when the death angel came, the oldest would die, firstborn would die. And of course, Pharaoh's firstborn died. And Pharaoh said, enough's enough, you Israelites get out of here. And so God, Moses delivered them with God's help. They went out of the land of Egypt. Of course, you know, Moses, uh, Pharaoh changed his mind <coughs> there. And of course, took them into the wandering of the wilderness there. God was taking them to a land that flowed with milk and honey, we see later on. Two years later, they had traveled. Uh, they could have gone into <coughs> this, <coughs> excuse me, the land that flowed with milk and honey, but the children of Israel were not faithful to God. They did some things that uh, showed their unfaithfulness to God, and as a result, God let them wander in the wilderness 38 years before they could go into the promised land. But here's the point. God gave privileges <clears throat> to the Israelites. He delivered them from the Egyptians. He gave them food and drink in their wanderings. Can you imagine 2.5 million people in the wilderness that have to be fed, that have to be <clears throat> given water and provided for with water each and every day? Can you imagine 2.5 million people the murmuring, the complaining that must have gone on at the time with Moses. God was leading them by a cloud. He was taken into the land that flowed with milk and honey. But yet, they were not faithful unto him. But let me say this. God also abundantly blesses us even today, does he not? When you think of all the blessings that we have in the world today. God has given unto us our health, if we have good health, that is a blessing within itself. <clears throat> now, you may not realize that till one day you get sick and then you realize just how much a blessing you have had during your life if you've not been a very sick person <clears throat> there. And so God continues to bless us even today, but even though God blesses us, 
He gives us the things we need as far as necessities are concerned. He takes care of those and then goes beyond that, gives some of us some of the things that we want, some of the things that we desire. <clears throat> but what do we do sometimes? We become unfaithful. Now, if God blesses us, we can see it with the Israelites. We can see what God did with Israel. I mean, all you have to do is be able to read and to think for yourself, and you can see how God blessed Israel in Egypt. He got them into Egypt. He kept good them, put them in the good land there in Egypt. He delivered them from the bondage of Egypt. He delivered them to a land that flowed with milk and honey. We can see that, and we ask ourselves all the time, why in the world couldn't Israel see what God was doing for them? We ask that question. But the question that we need to be asking is, why can't we see what God is doing for us? If we could see what God is doing for us, then we would remain faithful. We wouldn't be worried about this idea of being unfaithful to God. But here lies the problem. We can't see what God does for us, evidently. Because if God did for us what he did for Israel, then we would say, man, what a God. This is great to be a Christian. But somehow, some way, we find every excuse not to be faithful to God. Faithfulness is important as far as God is concerned. And we sometimes are not faithful to God because we can't see the good that he does. What has God done for you and I as a blessing today? First of all, he has delivered us from the bondage of sin. Delivered us from the bondage. Under the old law, the Israelites, they, were, they, could never, they could not get forgiveness. The only time the Israelites could get forgiveness is when Christ died on the cross and his blood went backwards as well as forwards and for those that were present. They had their sins roll forward. They were reminded every year of the sins they had committed. They couldn't get forgiveness, but God has delivered us from sin. We get forgiveness by the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at Romans chapter 6, there in verse 17, 16 and 17. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered you. And so God has made it possible today for you and I to have forgiveness of sins. That is a blessing the Israelites did not have. They had it in promise, but we have it whenever we repent, whenever we confess Christ, whenever we're baptized into the water and grave of baptism, we have forgiveness of sins at that moment. And you know what else we have? If we remain faithful to God, God will remain faithful to us. The blood of Christ will continually cleanse us from our unrighteousness. God allows us to be baptized into Christ Jesus, which puts us into the church, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. God has sustained us by Jesus, who is our bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life. He is the one that sustains us in the time of trial. He is the one whom we can turn to. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus can comfort us. Jesus can take care of us. But why can't we remain faithful then if Jesus can do all these good things for us? And when you look at the book of Ephesians chapter 1, you see all the spiritual blessings that are ours for being children of, of God. Why would we not want to be faithful to God? You see, friends, heaven or hell depends upon our faithfulness to God. If I'm faithful to God, heaven can be my home. If I'm unfaithful to God, then heaven won't be my home. Hell will. Because hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. And if I don't obey God, then I am a servant of Satan. 
It's one or the other, God or Satan. And so why would we not choose to be a servant of God? Why would we not choose to be faithful to God? Second of all this morning, we see here in the, the reading that we read a few moments ago, the unfaithfulness of Israel. The unfaithfulness of Israel. Israel, as I said earlier, was not always faithful to God. As a matter of fact, in verse 6, he talks about the sin of, lust, the sin of lust there. Israel was one who went after other things, kind of like we are even today. But they lusted for other things. Israel was also committed the sin of idolatry. Verse 7. They worshipped idols. Instead of staying faithful to God, they, they turned to, to worshipping idols. Not only did they worship idols, they also committed the sin of fornication. That's the idea of sexual impurities. Committing sin with someone other than whom you should be with. Per se, Galatians 5 and verse 19. See, Israel also tempted the Lord. They tempted the Lord. God provided them this, that, and the other. You remember God provided them drink. He provided them food. He provided them manna. He provided them quail. They got tired of the manna, so they began to murmur and complain. They wanted some quail, and so God sent them quail there. And they lusted after it so much that God caused a plague to come with that as well, and many of them were killed as a result of that. And then you get to the final thing there that they did, and that is the sin of murmuring, verse 10. They murmured against God. Do we ever murmur against God? Do we ever ask the question, Lord, why me? What did I do to deserve this? Is that not murmuring against God? Don't we have we not learned yet and do we not understand that God doesn't cause bad things to happen to us yet? God cannot cause evil to happen to you. If he does, if he does, then he's not God. God only gives good gifts. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes from the Father above in whom there's no neither variableness. That's it. God gives good gifts. And God knows how to give good gifts. If you as a parent know how to give good gifts to your children, what do you think God gives to you? You're his child. And God loves you. And God may allow you to be tried in life to see how faithful you will be. He always has done that. He's allowed Satan to tempt us. He allowed Satan to tempt Job. He allowed Satan to tempt Abraham in the fact that he asked Abraham to offer his son there upon a, as a sacrifice at Mount Moriah. Abraham was found to be faithful. The Bible says, and now I know the angel said of God. And so we have five sins here committed by Israel of unfaithfulness, lust, idolatry, fornication, tempting the Lord, murmuring. And we do the same thing. Why is this given to us? Why did Paul tell the Corinthians he was giving this to us? This is an example for us to follow after. Here is an example for us to learn from. If Israel did this, and God was displeased with it, if I do this, will God not be displeased with it also? Well, of course. What are we guilty of? Lust. We lust after things of the world, things that we should not lust after. James chapter 4, James writes, beginning with verse 1, From whence cometh wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your own lust, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill, desire to have. Cannot obtain, you fight in war, yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. 
Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Why do we do the things that we do that are against God? We lust. Because we want what we want when we want it. And that's the world we live in today. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow ye shall die. That's the attitude that people have today in the world. Even in the religious world, even though they would not admit it. I heard someone say the other day, he said, you, you go to church sometimes, and you go to Sunday school class, and the man that's in the Sunday school class teaching the lesson is one who was drunk with you the night before. Boy, that's really a good example, isn't it? Really a good example. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Why are we given this information? Why did... Paul wastes the time to write this if we don't learn from it. We need to learn that lust is wrong. Idolatry. We talk about idolatry and we get upset because, you know, we don't worship idols. We think. We don't have an idol setting on the mantle like these people did, the Israelites did. We don't have them sitting around and we worship. We didn't carve them out with our hands. No, you haven't. You may not have one setting on the mantle, but you may have one setting above the mantle, though. called TV. Sometimes that TV becomes your idol because you stay home and watch television rather than going to church so you can see the ball game or whatever it is you want to watch. It becomes your idol. Oh, you don't have it hand carved. You bought it though. It may be what's in your billfold that's your idol. It may be the fact that you have some, some money in your billfold and that seems to be your idol because you think you got to work sun up, sun down seven days a week so you can make ends meet leaving God out of the equation, friend. You don't have to work seven days a week. Put God back in the equation. Put him back in your life as he ought to be and I can assure you, he will take care of you. You may not have what you want in the world. That's the problem we have today. We have too many wants. We see too many people out in the world that are not Christians and not going to be Christians, that are living the life of Riley, and we think we as Christians who are doing right ought to be able to live the same way they do. That's not what the Bible ever promised you, friend. Nowhere in the Scripture will you find that promised. That which is out there is a miserable world. That which is in Christ is peace. Is peace. And we need to think about things like this. Idolatry. I don't commit idolatry. Well, you, you may very well do it and don't realize it. It all depends on what your idol is. And then there's fornication that they committed. Do we? And we have it going on in America today. We have men and women living together, acting as if there's nothing wrong with it. Why is that? Because everybody else is doing it. Well, it doesn't matter if everybody else does it. That doesn't make it right, does it? The Israelites did that as well. They did it in front of Moses. And it made Moses mad. They slew them. With the sword, the Bible says. You know, if we were to slay a lot of people before fornication today, we'd have a lot of people dead in the world. And then you have that of tempting God. We tempt God, do we not? We ask God why. We don't understand why that we have to suffer through this. We don't understand why this is... Does God not already answer that question? Why do we have trials and tribulations? What does it do for us in life? It builds character. It builds integrity. You don't have any trials in life. You have no character. You never have to face anything in life that's hard. There's no character. You're soft. And then when the trials do come, then you fall and falter. And friends, you have to put your trust in the God of heaven. God is the one that we need to trust in. And then third of all this morning, there is the encouragement the encouragement to faithfulness. Notice what the Apostle Paul said here, beginning with verses 11 through 13 again. Let's read it. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Why are these things written? For our admonition. This is for our encouragement. Listen, if we're going to be faithful to God, we must be faithful. We can't be unfaithful and expect God to count us faithful. 
Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You know, there is that attitude of pride in a lot of people. And I think a lot of this right here goes hand in hand with pride. Wherefore, let he that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. I'm as good as old brother so-and-so is in the church. I mean, that's, you're comparing yourself to the wrong person. You're not to compare yourself to the preacher, the elders, or the deacons, or anyone else in the church. Your comparison is to the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, how perfect are you? How good are you? See, when you compare it with the right one, then you can see things a little differently. Wherefore, let he that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Now, notice verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful. Hey, friends, you're not waiting on God to be faithful. God is faithful. He is always faithful. He is always the same. You ever notice some people sometimes, you know, you, you see them somewhere and they act one way. You see them somewhere else, they act another way. You, you never know what you're going to get out of them. You don't have to expect that with God. God is faithful. He is the same every time, every place you turn and look. God is the same. He is faithful. You don't have to worry about it. Is God going to be faithful to me this time? Trust me. If faithfulness is what you're waiting on, you're not waiting on God. You're waiting on yourself. And so he says here, God is faithful who will not suffer you. Notice this, to be tempted above that you're able. When temptations come in life, God says, and he's faithful in what he says, he's not going to allow you to be tempted above what you cannot overcome with his help. I didn't say you could overcome it without him. I said you can overcome it with his help. And with his help, you will be able to overcome anything that comes your way. That should give the Christian some assurance. That is a blessing within itself to know that whatever it is I have to face in life, God says I can deal with it with his help. I can deal with it. I don't have to worry about it. I can overcome this. Why? Because God said I could. He would be with me. If I am faithful, He's with me. I can overcome no matter what it is. Try it on your own. It won't happen. It won't happen. Because God is faithful with His help there. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. You see, friends, God has given us a great blessing if we're faithful to Him. He will be faithful to us. He will deliver us from trials and tribulations. He will deliver us from the temptations of the devil. Notice that He gives warnings against self-righteousness. You know, sometimes we become so self-righteous that we, we think that we, we have the corner on the market. And that's why we have to be careful because, let, wherefore, let he that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Talks about that. Then he says to take heed. There's a warning given unto us to take heed. We need to look at our lives. We need to examine ourselves in light of the Scripture so that we can see where we stand. Maybe we're weak. Maybe we need to be strengthened in areas. And there are ways to do that. There are studies to be done that can help you in those areas. And then there is that self-examination that we need to take. We need to look at our lives and make sure we're living a life as much as like Christ as we possibly can. The book of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. You see, we have to work at it because it's possible that we can fall short. We don't want to be short because eternity depends upon our faithfulness to God. Faithfulness is possible because our temptations can be overcome with God's help. How faithful are you? And when we talk about faithfulness, you notice I haven't said anything about church services, have I? You know why I haven't? 
you get it all faithful and you get it right, church service is not a problem. If you don't attend church services Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, you've got a faithfulness problem. And the reason is, I know that, I guess you can be hindered. I'm not saying if you're sick. I'm talking about you just choose not to come. There's a faithfulness problem on your part. Why would you not come? If the God of heaven is here to bless you, and whether you realize it or not, Jesus is among us this morning. God is amongst us this morning. He's not sitting on the front row up here. Well, he could be, I guess. And I can't see him. But you can't see him either. But he's here, and I know he's here, because he said he'd be here. So how faithful are we? If we could actually see Jesus sitting on the front row and God sitting on the other hand and looking over the audience when we started singing and looking over the audience when we petitioned in prayer and looking over the audience when we are giving and looking over the audience when we partook of the Lord's Supper, I can assure you we do every bit of it a completely different from what we do today. Now why is that? Why is it we would do it different? Think about it. God is with us. God is faithful. And God wants us to be faithful, just like He's faithful. And you know, friends, that's what life is all about. Being faithful to God. Heaven can be ours. Each and every one of us can go to heaven. Anybody on the earth that's living today can go to heaven. If only they're obedient to God's will, and that's what faithfulness is. Being trustworthy toward God. God is trustworthy toward you. He is faithful. He will do His part. Will you do yours? If you're here and you need to come this morning and make things right, if you're not a Christian, you need to become one. Be willing to say that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Are you willing to repent of your sins? Repentance is changing your mind, changing your way of life. It's not just saying you're sorry. You have to make some changes in your life. That's what repentance is. Confess His name publicly, that He is the Christ, the Son of God, to be baptized for the remission of sins, and if so, the Lord is willing to add you to His church. Nothing more, nothing less. If you're here this morning, you're a member of the Lord's church. Maybe you haven't been as faithful as you should. Maybe you know. You know and God knows, so you know you make the decision this morning. We encourage you to come as together we stand and sing.